colleagues and I don't want to spend time talking about ourselves during these hearings, but as someone who's run for office a few times, I can tell you at the end of a campaign, it all comes down to the numbers. The numbers tell you the winner and the loser. For the most part, the numbers don't lie. But if something doesn't add up with the numbers, you go to court to get resolution. And that's the end of the line. We accept those results. That's what it means to respect the rule of law. That's what it means to seek elective office in our democracy. Because those numbers aren't just numbers, they're votes. They're your votes. They are the will and the voice of the people. And the very least we should expect from any person seeking a position of public trust is the acceptance of the will of the people, win or lose. Donald Trump didn't. He didn't have the numbers, he went to court. He still didn't have the numbers, he lost. But he betrayed the trust of the American people. He ignored the will of the voters. He lied to his supporters and the country. And he tried to remain in office after the people had voted him out and the courts upheld the will of the people. This morning, we'll tell the story of how Donald Trump lost an election and knew he lost an election, and as a result of his loss, decided to wage an attack on our democracy, an attack on the American people by trying to rob you of your voice in our democracy, and in doing so, lit the fuse that led to the horrific violence of January 6th, when a mob of his supporters stormed the Capitol sent by Donald Trump to stop the transfer of power. Today, my colleague from California, Ms. Lofgren, and our witnesses will detail the select committee's findings on these matters. But first, I will recognize our distinguished vice chair, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, or any opening statement she'd care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Last week, uh, as the chairman noted, our committee began outlining a seven-part plan overseen by President Trump to overturn the 2020 election. Today, we will begin looking at the initial part of that plan. President Trump's effort to convince millions of Americans that the election was stolen from him by overwhelming fraud. A federal court has already reviewed elements of the committee's evidence on this point and said this, quote, in the months following the election, numerous credible sources from the president's inner circle to agency leadership and statisticians informed President Trump and Dr. Eastman that there was no evidence of election fraud, close quote, sufficient to overturn the 2020 presidential election. The court's opinion methodically documents each of the principal reasons for that conclusion, and I would urge all those watching to read it. Today, we will begin to show the American people some of our evidence. Today, you will hear much more from a former Attorney General Bill Barr's recorded testimony, and you will hear in greater detail what others in the department told President Trump that his claims of election fraud were nonsense. You will also hear much more from President Trump's own campaign experts, who had also concluded that his fraud claims could not be supported. Let me focus briefly on just three points now. First, you will hear firsthand testimony that the president's campaign advisors urged him to await the counting of votes and not to declare victory on election night. The president understood even before the election that many more Biden voters had voted by mail because President Trump ignored the advice of his
if aggregated and read most favorably to the campaign, would that be outcome determinative? And um, I think everyone's assessment in the room, at least amongst the staff, Mark Short, myself, and Greg Jacob, was that it was not sufficient to be outcome determinative. As is obvious, this was before the attack on the Capitol. The Trump campaign legal team knew there was no legitimate argument, fraud, irregularities, or anything to overturn the election. And yet President Trump went ahead with his plans for January 6th anyway. Mr. Chairman, hundreds of our countrymen have faced criminal charges. Many are serving criminal sentences because they believed what Donald Trump said about the election and they acted on it. They came to Washington, D.C. at his request they marched on the Capitol at his request, and hundreds of them besieged and invaded the building at the heart of our constitutional republic. As one conservative editorial board put it recently, quote, Mr. Trump betrayed his supporters by conning them on January 6th, and he is still doing it. Another conservative editorial board that has long supported President Trump said last week, Donald Trump, quote, won't stop insisting that, the 2020, that 2020 was stolen, even though he has offered no proof that that is true. And this, Donald Trump now, quote, clings to more fantastical theories, such as Dinesh D'Souza's debunked 2,000 mules, even as recounts in Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin confirm Trump lost. Those are the correct conclusions to draw from the evidence gathered by this committee. We have much more evidence to show the American people on this point than we can reasonably show in one hearing. But today, we will begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Without objection, without objection the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In our opening hearing, we gave an overview of our investigation into the We examined the false narrative that the 2020 election was, quote, stolen. Former President Trump's plan to overturn the election relied on a sustained effort to deceive millions of Americans with knowingly false claims of election fraud. All elements of the plot relied on convincing his supporters about these false claims. Today, we'll demonstrate the 2020 election was not stolen. The American people elected President Joe Biden. We'll present evidence that Mr. Trump's claims of election fraud were false, that he and his closest advisors knew those claims were false, but they continued to peddle them anyway, right up until the moments before a mob of Trump supporters attacked the Capitol. We'll also show that the Trump campaign used these false claims of election fraud to raise hundreds of millions of dollars from supporters who were told their donations were for the legal fight in the courts. But the Trump campaign didn't use the money for that. The big lie was also a big ripoff. The former president laid the groundwork for these false claims well in advance of the election. As early as April 2020, Mr. Trump claimed that the only way he could lose an election would be as a result of fraud. Do you know the things with bundling and all of the things that are happening with uh, votes by mail, where thousands of votes are gathered and I'm not going to say which party does it, but thousands of votes are gathered and they come in and they're dumped in a location and then all of a sudden you lose elections if you think you're going to win. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. It's the only way we're going to lose this election. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. Did you see what's going on? Take a look at West Virginia, mailmen selling the ballots. They're being sold. They're being dumped in rivers. This is a horrible thing for our country. There is no, this is not, there is no this is not going to end well. Mr. Trump decided even before the election that regardless of the facts and the truth, if he lost the election, he would claim it was rigged. 
Mr. Trump was right about one thing. It did not end well. On election night, Mr. Trump claimed even before the votes were counted that his loss was a result of fraud. Now Thursday, we had testimony from Attorney General Barr about the Department of Justice uh, investigation of Mr. Trump's fraud claims. Barr told Trump directly that his claims were BS. Yet, after hearing the truth and that warning from the AG, Mr. Trump continued to peddle the false claims of fraud. You'll hear detailed testimony from Attorney General Barr describing the various election fraud claims the Department of Justice investigated. He'll tell you how he told Mr. Trump repeatedly that there was no merit to those claims. Mr. Barr will tell us that Mr. Trump's election night claims of fraud were made without regard to the truth and before it was even possible to look for evidence of fraud. Attorney General Barr wasn't alone. You'll see and hear today other Department of Justice officials and senior advisors to Mr. Trump that they told him the claims he was making were not supported by evidence. The election fraud claims were false. Mr. Trump's closest advisors knew it. Mr. Trump knew it. That didn't stop him from pushing the false claims and urging his supporters to, quote, fight like hell, to, quote, take back their country. After he lost the election, various legal challenges were made. You'll hear testimony today from a renowned Republican election litigation lawyer who explained the normal process by which candidates challenge an election. Rather than accept the results of the election and the decisions of the courts, Mr. Trump pursued a different strategy. He tried to convince the American people the election had been stolen. Many of his supporters believed him, and many still believe him today. The attack on January 6th was a direct and predictable result of Mr. Trump's decision to use false claims of election fraud to overturn the election and to cling to power. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. I now welcome our first witness. We're joined today by former Fox News politics editor Chris Stilewalk. Bill Stepien, President Trump's former campaign manager, was subpoenaed to be here and was in Washington this morning prepared to testify. Kevin Marino, Mr. Stepien's attorney, is here with us today. Thank you, Mr. Marino, for coming. And he was advised, uh, he has advised us that Mr. Stepien's wife went into labor this morning. Mr. Stepien unexpectedly had to travel to be with his wife, and we wish him the best. Due to the depth and rigor of our investigation, we have several hours of Mr. Stepien's testimony from when we interviewed him in February, and we will be presenting that testimony today. I'll now swear in our witness. The witness will please stand and raise his right hand. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. I now recognize myself for questions. I want to start by showing a video that tells the story of what was going on in the Trump White House on election night in November of 2020. Do you remember where you were on the night of the election, November the 3rd? I was at the White House. You know where specifically over the course of that night you spent your time within the White House? There was an event that was organized in the residence, so I moved between um, the residence, a room sort of off the residence um, where some family members were. I take it the president was upstairs in the residence. He was upstairs. I was, we were kind of on the first floor, so not uh, upstairs. We were with, uh, uh, mostly with Ivanka and her brothers and, and a couple other people who'd be coming in and out. Can you just describe the atmosphere? What were people expecting that night when you got to the White House? 
I think that there was typically for people who show up there um, on election night, it's going to be a self-select, more positive environment. Uh, I think people were a little bit nervous, not knowing what was going to happen with the red wave or the red mirage as the debate was being carried out. The Fox News Decision Desk is calling Arizona for Joe Biden. That is a big get for the Biden campaign. Arizona's call. Do you remember that? I do. What do you remember happening uh, where you were when Arizona was called? Um, I, uh, there was a uh, surprise at the call. Who was surprised? Most, most everyone in the room. Were you being one of them? Yes. Did that shift the atmosphere or the attitude in the White House? Completely. How so? Can you describe that? Because Fox News was the first one to go out and say that. So was it anger kind of directed towards Fox News for making a call more so than a disappointment that maybe the campaign lost Arizona? All the above. So both anger and disappointment. Uh, both disappointment with Fox and uh, concern that maybe our data or our numbers weren't accurate. Were you in the White House residence during the sort of past midnight into the early morning hours of, of November 4th? Uh, yes, oh sure, it went over beyond midnight, yes. Do you remember Rudy Giuliani being at the White House on election night and into the early hours the next morning? I do. What do you remember about when he came? Um, he, he was, uh, there were, I had heard that he was uh, upstairs, you know, in that aforementioned uh, reception area and he was looking to talk to the president, and it was suggested instead that he come talk uh, to several of us um, down off the map room. You said that Mr. You had heard that Mr. Giuliani wanted to talk to the president, and then he was directed your way. Did you end up talking to Mr. Giuliani when he was directed I did. your way? I did. What was that conversation? A lot of conversations were directed my way. Uh, <laughs> um, a few of us. Myself, Jason Miller, Justin Clark, and Mark Meadows gathered um, in a room off the map room uh, to to listen uh, to, to whatever Rudy presumably wanted to say to the president. Was there anyone in that conversation who, in your observation, had had, had too much to drink? Uh, like Mayor Giuliani. Tell me more about that. What was your observation about his uh, potential intoxication during that, that discussion about what the president should say uh, when he's addressed the nation on election night? And the mayor was definitely intoxicated, but I do not um, know that his level of talk intoxication when he spoke uh, with the president, for example. Were you part of any discussions uh, with uh, the, the people I mentioned, Mr. Stepien, Mr. Meadows, or anyone else, about whether the president should make uh, any sort of speech on election night? I, I, I mean, I, I spoke to the president. They may have been present, but the um, president spoke to the president several times that night. There are suggestions by, I believe it was Mayor Giuliani, to go and declare victory and say that we won it outright. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Um, ballots, ballots were still being counted. Ballots were still going to be counted for days. Um, and it was far too early to be making any proclamation like that. I remember saying that, I, to the best of my memory, I, I was saying that we should not go and declare victory until we had a better sense of the numbers. Okay, can you be more specific about that conversation, in particular what Mayor Giuliani said, your response, and then anybody else in the room's response? I think effectively Mayor Giuliani was saying, we want it, they're stealing it from us, where'd all the votes come from, we need to go say that we won, 
and essentially that anyone who didn't agree with that position was being weak. What was your view at the time as to what he should or shouldn't say? I don't know that I had a, a firm view um, as to what he should say uh, in that circumstance. The results were still being counted. Um, it was becoming clear that the race would not be called um, on election night. My belief, my recommendation was to say that votes were still being counted. It's too early to to, to tell, um, too early to, to call the race. But, um, you know, we are uh, proud of the race we've, we run, we ran, um, and we, you know, think we're, think we're in, a, in, in good position. Um, and we'll have more to say about this, you know, the next day or the next day, whenever we had something to say. And did anybody who was a part of that conversation disagree with your message? Yes. Who is that? The, the president disagreed with that. I don't recall the particular words. He, he thought I was wrong. He, he told me so. And, uh, you know, that they were going to, you know, go in a, in a you know, he was going to go in a different direction. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. Mr. Stywalt, did President Trump have any basis to declare victory on November 4th, 2020? Thank you. Mr. Stepien also testified that President Trump had no basis for declaring victory at that point in time. My, my belief, my recommendation was to say that votes were still being counted. It's too early to, to, to tell, um, too early to, to call the race, but, um, you know, we, uh, Proud of the race we we run we ran, um, and we, you know, think we're think we're in a in, in, in good position, um, and we'll have more to say about this, you know, the next day or the next day whenever we had something to say. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stowell. After the votes were counted, who won the presidential election of 2020? Uh, Joseph Robinette Biden, Jr. of the great state of Delaware. Thank you. That's the bottom line. We've had an election. Mr. Trump lost, but he refused to accept the results of the democratic process. Pursuant to Section 5C8 of House Resolution 503, I now recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schauwald, I'd like you to explain a term that was thrown around a lot during the election, and that's the so-called red mirage. What does that mean? <clears throat> so in the 40 or 50 years, let's say, that Americans have increasingly chosen to vote by mail or early or absentee, <clears throat> Democrats prefer that method of voting more than Republicans do. So basically, in every election, Republicans win election day, and Democrats win the early vote. And then you wait and start counting, and it depends on which ones you count first, but usually it's election day votes that get counted first. And you see the Republicans shoot ahead, and then the process of, of bailing and binding and unbinding all those mail-in votes, uh, and some states like Pennsylvania refuse to count the votes first, so you have to wait for all of that to come in. So in every election, and certainly a national election, you expect to see the Republican with a lead, but it's not really a lead. Um, when you put together a jigsaw puzzle, it doesn't matter which piece you put in first, it ends up with the same image. So for us, who cares? Uh, but 
that's because no candidate had ever tried to avail themselves of this quirk in the election counting system. We had gone to pains, uh, and I'm proud of the pains we went to, to make sure that we were informing viewers that this was going to happen because the Trump uh, campaign and the president had made it clear that they were going to try to exploit this anomaly. And we knew it was going to be bigger because the percentage of early votes was higher, right? We went from about 45% of the votes being early and absentee to because of the pandemic, that increased by about 50%. So we knew it would be longer, we knew it would be more. So we wanted to keep telling viewers, hey, look, the number that you see here is sort of irrelevant because it's only a small percentage of these votes. So this red mirage, that's really what you expected to happen on election night. Happens every time. Thank you, Mr. Steyerwald. Now, I'd like to play a, a clip of Attorney General uh, Bill Barr, who also explains what was expected to happen on election night. Right out of the box on election night, the president uh, claimed that there was major fraud underway. I mean, this happened, as far as I could tell, before there was actually any potential of looking at evidence. And it seemed to be based on the dynamic that uh, that at the end of the evening, a lot of Democratic votes came in, which changed the vote counts in certain states. And that seemed to be the basis for this broad claim that there was major fraud. And I didn't think much of that because people had been talking for weeks and everyone understood for weeks that that was going to be what happened on election night. Mr. Stepien obviously could not be with us today, and it's proper for him to be with his wife as they welcome their child. Uh, but he also had discussions uh, with the president about the red mirage, that is, that it would be a long night and that early votes would favor him, but that lots more votes would be counted over the course of the night and the days after. So let's play uh, clip one from our interview with Mr. Stepien. I, I recounted back to that conversation uh, with him in which I said, just like I said in 2016, it was going to be a long night. Um, I, I told him in 2020 that, um, you know, there were, it was going to be a, a process again um, as, you know, the, the early returns are going to be, you know, positive and we're going to, you know, be watching the returns of, of, of ballots as, you know, they rolled in thereafter. So so is it fair to say you're trying to present a, a re, what you thought would be a realistic picture of what might happen over the course of that night, being election night? That night and the days that followed. Yeah, I, I, uh, I always, uh, I always, you know, I always told the president the truth, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, I think he expected that from me, and uh, I told him it was going to be a, a process. It was going to be, um, you know. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to have to wait and see how this turned out. Um, so I, I, just like I did in 2016, I did the same thing in 2020. So let's watch a short clip of President Trump speaking after he received that information from his campaign advisors. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at four o'clock in the morning and add them to the list. So when former President Trump said that, it contradicted what his advisors had warned would happen. We all know that mail-in ballots played an important role in the 2020 election. However, President Trump continuously discouraged mail-in voting. Mr. Stepien was so concerned about the president's position on mail-in voting that in the summer of 2020, he met with President Trump uh, along with House Minority Leader uh, Kevin McCarthy. Let's play clip four. Meeting uh, that was had um, in particular, um, I invited uh, Kevin McCarthy to join the meeting, uh, he being of like mind on, on the issue uh, with me, mm -hmm. um, in which we made our case for, for why we believed mail-in balloting, mail-in voting, um, 
not to be a bad thing for his campaign. Um, but, uh, you know, the president's mind was, was, was made up and you understand, um, you know, how many times to, you know, go to the well on a particular topic. Yeah, I understand. Tell me a little bit more about the argument that you and Mr. McCarthy made to the president in that meeting as to why it wasn't a bad thing that mail-in voting was available. Large, largely two pillars to that argument, both of which I've uh, previously mentioned. One, you know, leaving a good deal to chance, uh, pushing or uh, urging your voters to vote only on election day leaves a lot to chance. Uh, that's that's A. And B, uh, also previously mentioned, um, the fact that the Trump campaign, the Republican National Committee, the Republican Party had an advantage of, of, of grassroots workers and volunteers on the ground that would allow, um, you know, an, an advantage to enhance return rates of, of ballots that were mailed. Those were the two yeah. the pillars of the argument. I see. And what, if anything, do you recall Representative McCarthy saying during that meeting? We were we were echoing the same argument. I mean, his his words echo, uh, echoed mine and, and vice versa on those on those two topics. Mr. Starwalt, you were at the decision desk at Fox News on election night and you called Arizona early for President Biden, which was controversial. How did you make that call, and where did you think the race stood in the early hours of the next day? Well, it was really controversial to our competitors, who we beat so badly by making the correct call first. Uh, our decision desk uh, was the best in the business, and I was very proud to be a part of it. Uh, because we had, a, uh, we had partnered with the Associated Press and the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, uh, thanks to uh, my colleague and friend Arnon Mishkin, uh, had built a wonderful device for forecasting the outcomes of elections. So we had a different set of data than our competitors did. We had more research, uh, and we had a better system, and we had a great team. Um, so what you're waiting to see is, do the actual votes match up with the expectations in the poll? The real votes are testing the quality of your poll in targeted precincts and in targeted places. And let me tell you, our poll in Arizona was beautiful, and it was doing just what we wanted it to do, and it was cooking up just right. And at some point, and I forget exactly uh, who, but at some point it became clear that Arizona was getting ready to make a call. So we, around, uh, you know, my boss, Bill Salmon, said we're not making any call until everybody says yes, because that was always our policy, unanimity. And you have to understand, in this room, you have, you know, the the best people from academia, Democrats, Republicans, a broad cross section of people who had worked together for a decade who were really serious about this stuff. So we knew it would be a consequential call because it was one of five states that really mattered, right? Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona were the ones that we were watching. We knew it would be significant to call any one of those five, but we already knew Trump's chances were very small and getting smaller based on what we had seen. So. We were able to make the call early. Uh, we were able to beat the competition. Uh, we looked around the room, everybody says yay, and on we go. And by the time we found out how much everybody was freaking out and losing their minds over this call, we were already trying to call the next state. We had already moved on. We were into Georgia, we were to North Carolina. We were looking at these other states. Uh, so we thought it was, we were pleased, but not surprised. I see. You know, after the election, as of November 7th, in your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. I mean, I guess there, you could, you, it's always possible that you could have, you know, uh, a truckload of ballots be found somewhere, I suppose. But once you get into this space, you know, um, ahead of today, I thought about what are the largest margins that could ever be overturned by a recount and the normal kind of, the kind of stuff that we heard Mike Pence talking about sounding like a normal Republican that night when he said, you know, we'll keep every challenge. Nothing like that. In a recount, you're talking about hundreds of votes. 
when we think about calling a race, one of the things that we would think about is, is it outside the margin of a recount? And when we think about that margin, we think about, in modern history, you're talking about 1,000 votes, 1,500 votes at the way, way outside. Normally, you're talking about hundreds of votes, maybe 300 votes that are going to change. So the idea that through any normal process in any of these states, remember, he had to do it thrice, right? He needed three of these states to change. And in order to do that, I mean, you're at, you're at uh, an infant, you're better off to play the Powerball uh, than to <laughs> have that come in. On November 7th, the other major news outlets called the race for President Biden. Now, Mr. Stepien told the committee that he thought the odds were, and this is a quote, very, very, very bleak, and held a meeting with the president that same day. Let's uh, show clip eight, video clip eight. I mean, with each day that wore on, I mean, the, the, the trajectory of the race you know, on election night, Trump ahead um, in, in, in many states, and as, as that week wore on, as the third became the fourth, became the fifth, and so on and so forth, and the vote by mail ballots were tabulated, you know, Trump's, Trump's lead, you know, grew more narrow. And, and, in, and in some places, Biden surpassed, you know, Trump in, in the vote totals. So as, as the week wore on, um, as we paid attention to those numbers every single, multiple times a day, um, you know, internally, um, you know, I, I, I was feeling less confident for sure. What was your view on the state of the election at that point? Um, you know, uh, very, very, very bleak. Um, you know, I, 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 I we, we told him, um, you know, the group that went over there, um, outlined, you know, my belief in, 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 in chances for success at this point. And, and then we, we pegged it at, at, you know, five, maybe, maybe 10% based on recounts that were, that, that, you know, either were automatically initiated or, or, or could be, um, could be initiated um, based on, you know, realistic legal challenges, not all the legal challenges that eventually were pursued. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, you know, my belief is that it was a very, very, I mean, five to 10 percent. It's not a very good uh, optimistic outlook. Now, as President Trump and others continued to claim that the election was stolen, there were lawyers who were a part of the campaign, campaign lawyers, who were responsible for investigating the fraud claims. Uh, that includes Alex Cannon, who could not validate the claims that were being made, uh, including those being made by the president. Let's roll video 15, 13. This is an email. Uh, it's two emails, actually. The first is from Alex Cannon to you and Faith McPherson. And then you forward that email on to uh, Mark Meadows, Justin Clark, and Jason Miller, the subject being AZ Federal ID Voters. Um, if you look at the original email there, it said, Bill, we completed the AZ analysis you requested. I assume that's about Arizona. Um, and because of the, un the substantial uncertainty surrounding the databases, this is a highly unreliable way to identify ineligible voters. Can you explain the task that you gave to Ms. Cannon um, for this Arizona analysis? Sure. Um, previously, I um, described some of my frustration with some of the, the claims that people would, would throw at President Trump regarding, you know, you know, need to look at this, you know, this happened in this state or that happened in that state. And it would be, you know, those would flow to us um, to, to, to look into. I had talked about that before, I think. Yep. Uh, you know, this is an example of that. I recall, I recall um, in Arizona, someone had thrown out, I believe this to be the claim that there were thousands of um, illegal citizens, um, people not eligible to vote, having cast their ballots in Arizona. Someone had thrown out that claim to President Trump. Um, and with, you know, the margins being as close as they were, as I previously described, you know, that could potentially matter. Um, so this, this 
wild claim is thrown out, which, you know, on its face didn't seem, you know, realistic or possible to me. I asked Alex to look at the, you know, the claim. And I haven't read this full email, but I recall the response to that. The reality of that was not illegal citizens voting in the election. I think it was like overseas voters voting in the election. So obviously, you know, people who were eligible to vote. When these findings were passed up the chain to President Trump, he became frustrated and he replaced the campaign's legal team. Let's play clip 14. You know, I think the president, it was during the second week where things like you displayed were occurring, where he was, you know, growing increasingly unhappy with, you know, his team, you know, me, less so because I was less involved at this point, but still me, growing increasingly unhappy with Justin Clark. And that kind of, you know, you know, paved the way for, you know, Justin to be moved out and Mayor Giuliani to be moved in as the person in charge of, you know, the legal side of the campaign and for all intents and purposes, the campaign at that point. Now, when Mr. Stepien became campaign manager, he was the second Trump campaign manager for the 2020 race. And there were only about 115 days until Election Day. So let's play the video. I inherited a campaign that was, the day I was hired was, I believe, President Trump's low point in the 2020 daily average polling against President Biden. It was a campaign at a low point in the polls. It was structurally and fiscally deficient. You know, I, you know, there was a great deal wrong with the campaign in both of those, in both of those areas. So most of my day spent fixing what, and I think I took over with 115 days left in the campaign. Most of my time spent fixing the things that could be fixed with 115 days left in the campaign. Now, Mr. Stepien has been in the campaign field for a long time, and he worked for lots of different candidates and campaigns. He testified to this committee about his concerns, given the claims that Mr. Giuliani and Ms. Powell and their team were making publicly. Let's play clip 15. Okay, and was it important for you, Mr. Stepien, to sort of pull back just for your own professional reputation? You didn't want to be associated with some of what you were hearing from the Giuliani team and others that sort of stepped in in the wake of your departure? I didn't mind being categorized. There were two groups of them. We called them kind of my team and Rudy's team. I didn't mind being characterized as being part of Team Normal, as reporters, you know, kind of started to do around that point in time. You know, I said, you know, hours ago, early on that, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, 25 years, and I've spanned, you know, political ideologies from Trump to McCain to Bush to Christie, you know, and, you know, I can work under a lot of circumstances for a lot of varied, you know, candidates and politicians, but a situation where, and I think along the way, I've built up a pretty good, I hope, a good reputation for being honest and professional, and I didn't think what was happening was necessarily honest or professional at that point in time. So that led to me stepping away. So the president did get rid of Team Normal, and I'd like to play a clip showing that the president found the people he needed to perpetuate his claims of fraud. They saw a big truck bringing in 100,000 ballots in garbage cans, in waste paper baskets, 
in cardboard boxes and in shopping baskets. And every single one of them was for Biden because they were being notified by Smartmatic in Frankfurt that Biden was way behind and they better come up with a lot more ballots and we can prove every single thing I just said. If you gave me the paper ballots, I could probably turn around each one of these states. I'm absolutely convinced if you if you let me examine each one of those ballots, I pull out enough that were fraudulent that it would uh, shake the hell out of, of the country. It can set and run an algorithm that probably ran all over the country to take a certain percentage of votes from President Trump and flip them to President Biden, which we might never have uncovered had the votes for President Trump not been so overwhelming in so many of these states that it broke the algorithm. I remember that one of the things Mark said at some point was, you can't show an actual vote was flipped, which I found at the time to be a remarkable assertion because <laughs> because you don't have to have the gun to see the body lying on the floor bleeding out with five bullet holes in it was killed by a gun. What they were proposing, I thought was nuts. And then the theory was also completely nuts, right? I mean, it was a combination of Italians and Germans. I mean, different things have been floating around as to who was involved. I mean, Hugo Chavez in the Venezuelan, she has an affidavit from somebody who says they wrote a software in and something with the Philippines and that just all over the radar. Did you ever share, Mr. Kushner, your view of Mr. Giuliani? Did you ever share your perspective about him with the president? Um, I, I guess, uh, yes. Tell me what you said. Basically not the approach I would take if I was you. Okay, and, and how did he react? How did President Trump react when you shared that view with him? No, we said, you know, I, 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 I have confidence in Rudy. I think I had conversations with probably all of our council who were signed up to assist on election day as they um, disengaged with the campaign. The general consensus was that um, the law firms were not comfortable making um, the arguments that Rudy Giuliani was making publicly. I seem to recall that I had a similar conversation with most all of them. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it. And that's one of the reasons that went into me deciding to leave when I did. Even Sidney Powell defending herself in a defamation lawsuit brought by Dominion Voting Systems, argued that, quote, no reasonable person would conclude that her statements were truly statements of fact. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the witness for joining us today. The first panel is now dismissed. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last week, uh, we presented the testimony of former uh, Attorney General Bill Barr, uh, who testified before uh, this committee. Today, we present additional evidence, including his testimony that former President Trump started making claims of election fraud immediately after the election, and that Barr concluded the claims were untrue. Now, due to the length of Attorney General Barr's testimony, we're only going to include relevant portions at the hearing today. So let's play um, the video. The department, in fact, when we uh, received specific and credible allegations of fraud, made an effort to look into these to satisfy ourselves 
that they were without merit. And I was in the posture of trying to figure out, there was an avalanche of all these allegations of fraud that built up over a number of days, and it was like playing whack-a-mole because something would come out one day and then the next day it would be another issue. Also, I was influenced by the fact that all the early claims that I understood were completely bogus and silly and usually based on complete misinformation. And so I didn't consider the quality of claims right out of the box to give me any feeling that there was really substance here. For the first time since the election, the Attorney General spoke personally with the President on November 23rd, and this was at the White House. Let's play the video, please. So on November 23rd, I hadn't spoken to the President since the election, and in fact, as I said, since the middle of October, roughly. And it was a little getting awkward because obviously he had lost the election and I hadn't said anything to him. And so Cipollone said, you know, I think it's time you come over here. And so I came over to meet with the President in the Oval Office, and Meadows and Cipollone were there. And the President, and this is leading up to this conversation with Kushner, the President said there had been major fraud and that as soon as the facts were out, the results of the election would be reversed. And he went on on this for quite a while, as he's prone to do. And then he got to something that I was expecting, which is to say that apparently the Department of Justice doesn't think that it has a role of looking into these fraud claims. So I said, you know, that has to be the campaign that raises that with the state. The Department doesn't take side in elections, and the Department is not an extension of your legal team. And our role is to investigate fraud, and we'll look at something if it's specific, credible, and could have affected the outcome of the election. And we're doing that, and it's just not, they're just not meritorious. They're not panning out. And as I walked out of the Oval Office, Jared was there with Dan Scavino, who ran his, ran the President's social media, and who I thought was a reasonable guy, and believe is a reasonable guy. And I said, how long is, how long is he going to carry on with this stolen election stuff? Where's this going to go? And by that time, Meadows had caught up with me, and leaving the office, and caught up to me, and said that, he said, look, I think that he's becoming more realistic, and knows that there's a limit to how far he can take this. And then Jared said, you know, yeah, we're working on this. We're working on it. Even after his Attorney General told him his claims of election fraud were false, President Trump continued to promote these claims. I felt that things continued to deteriorate between the 23rd and the weekend of the 29th. And then on November 29th, he appeared on Maria Bartiromo's show, Sunday Futures, I believe it was. And he said that the department was missing in action. Well, no, we had glitches where they moved thousands of votes from my account to Biden's account. And these are glitches. So they're not glitches, they're theft. They're fraud, absolute fraud. This election was over, and then they did dumps. They call them dumps, big, massive dumps in Michigan and Pennsylvania and all over. How the FBI and Department of Justice, I don't know, maybe they're involved, but how people are allowed to get away from this stuff, with this stuff, is unbelievable. Now, spurred by what he saw, Barr told the Associated Press on December 1st that there was no evidence of election fraud, and immediately after, Attorney General Barr's statement went public. Mr. Trump berated, and he nearly fired Barr, but Barr persisted in telling the President that there was no evidence to support the fraud claims. This got under my skin, but I also felt it was time for me to say something. So on, I had, I set up a lunch with the AP reporter, Mike Balsamo, 
And I told him at lunch, uh, I made the statement um, that to date we have not seen fraud on a scale that could have affected a different outcome in the election. I had a later meeting scheduled at the White House at 3 o'clock with Meadows. Uh, this was previously scheduled, so I knew this was going to come up, and I went over there, and I told my secretary that I thought I would probably be fired and told not to to go home. <laughs> I mean, not to go back to my office, so I said, you might have to pack up for me. And uh, so when I got over there, I met with the chief of staff. He said the president was angry. Uh, he didn't really go get into the issue of the fraud. Uh, and then I went up to Pat Cipollone's office, and we were talking with each other. Uh, and the word came down that he wanted us both to go to the Oval. And the president was as mad as I've ever seen him, and he was trying to control himself. And the president said, well, this is you know, killing me. Uh, you didn't have to say this. You must have said this because you hate Trump. You hate Trump. And then he raised the, the, the big vote dump, uh, as he called it, in Detroit. And that, you know, he said people saw boxes coming into the counting station at all hours of the morning and so forth. And I explained to him that I, I, at that point I knew the exact number of precincts in Detroit. I think it was 630 something. I said, Mr. President, there are 630 precincts in Detroit. And unlike elsewhere in the state, they centralized the counting process. So they're not counted in each precinct. They're moved to counting stations. And so, a normal process would involve boxes coming in at all different hours. So there's nothing. And I said, did anyone point out to you, did all the people complaining about it point out to you, you actually did better in Detroit than you did, you did last time? I mean, there's no indication of fraud in Detroit. And uh, I told him that the stuff that his people were shoveling out to the public were bull, was bullshit. I mean, that the claims of fraud were bullshit. And... Uh, you know, he was indignant about that. And um, I reiterated that they'd wasted a whole month on these claims on the Dominion voting machines, and they were idiotic claims. And uh, I specifically raised the Dominion voting machines, which I found to be among the most uh, disturbing allegations, disturbing in the sense that I saw absolutely zero basis for the allegations but they were made in such a sensational way that they obviously were influencing a lot of people, uh, members of the public, that there was this systemic corruption in the system and that their votes didn't count and that these machines controlled by somebody else were actually determining it, which was complete nonsense. And it was being laid out there. And I told them that it was, that it was uh, crazy stuff and they were wasting their time on that. And uh, it was doing a great, grave disservice to the country. Okay, so the very next day, the president released a video rehashing some of the very same claims that his chief law enforcement officer had told him were, quote, nonsense. Here's an example. This is Michigan. At 6.31 in the morning, a vote dump of 149,772 votes came in unexpectedly. We were winning by a lot. That batch was received in horror. We have a company that's very suspect. Its name is Dominion. With the turn of a dial, or the change of a chip, you can press a button for Trump, and the vote goes to Biden. What kind of a system is this? Barr again told the president that there was nothing to these claims on December 14th. When I walked in, sat down, he went off on a uh, monologue uh, saying that there was now definitive evidence uh, involving fraud uh, through the Dominion machines. And a report had been prepared by a very reputable cybersecurity firm, which he identified as Allied Security Operations Group. And he held up the report 
and he had a, and he, then he asked that a copy of it be made for me. And while a copy was being made, he said, you know, this is absolute proof that the Dominion machines were rigged. The report means that I'm going to have a second term. And then he gave me a copy of the report. And as he talked more and more about it, uh, I sat there flipping through the report and looking through it. And um, to be frank, it looked very amateurish to me. Didn't have the credentials of the people involved, but I didn't see any real qualifications. And the statements were made very uh, uh, conclusory, like, you know, this, these machines were designed to, you know, engage in fraud or something to that effect, but I didn't see any supporting information for it. And I was somewhat demoralized because I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. On the other hand, you know, when I went into this and would, you know, tell him how crazy some of these allegations were, there was never, there was never an indication of interest in what the actual facts were. In my opinion then and my opinion now is that uh, the election was not stolen by fraud. And uh, I haven't seen anything since the election that changes my mind on that, including the 2000 Mules movie. <laughs> well, maybe you can uh, assess that 2000 Mules and people are talking about that. Well, I mean, just in a nutshell, you know, I just think that the GBI was unimpressed with it. And I was similarly unimpressed with it because I think if you, because uh, I was holding my fire on that to see what the photographic evidence was because I thought, well, hell, if they have a lot of photographs of the same person dumping a lot of ballots in different boxes, you know, that's hard to explain. Um, so I wanted to see what the photographic evidence was. But the uh, cell phone data is, is singularly unimpressive. I mean, it basically, if you take two million uh, cell phones and and figure out where they are physically in a big city like Atlanta or wherever, just by definition, you're going to find many hundreds of them have passed by and spent time in the vicinity of these boxes. And the premise that, if, you know, if you go by a box, you know, five boxes or whatever it was, you know, that that's a mule is just un indefensible. It, 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 by definition, you're going to have a lot of hundreds of this. I mean, one, I saw one contractor said, we figured out that our truck alone would account for six uh, cell phone signals. Uh, this was a, you know, a, a, some kind of contractor. And, you know, our route would take us by these things on a regular basis. So I, I but then you know, when the movie came out, uh, you know, I think the photographic evidence in it was completely lack. I mean, it was, there was a little bit of it, but it was lacking, you know, it didn't, it didn't establish widespread uh, illegal, um, Harvesting. The other thing is people don't understand is that uh, it's not clear that even if you can show harvesting that that changes the the results of the election. You're not the courts are not going to throw out votes uh, and then figure out you know, what votes were harvested and throw them out. It's still the burden on the challenging party to show that illegal votes were cast. Votes were the result of undue influence or bribes or, or there was really, you know, the person was non compass mentis. Uh, but absent that evidence, I, don't, I just didn't see courts throwing out votes anyway. I felt that uh, before the election, it was possible to talk sense to the president. Uh, and while you sometimes had to uh, engage in, uh, you know, a big wrestling match with him, uh, that it was possible to keep things on track, but I was uh, felt that after the election, he didn't seem to be listening, and I didn't think it was, uh, uh, you know, that I that I was inclined not to stay around if he wasn't listening to advice from me or his other cabinet secretaries. So on December fourteenth, Barr quit. Now, the Attorney General wasn't the only person who told the President that his claims were false. Other officials and close advisors told him the same thing.
other than try to address a counterfactual or a hypothetical, let me just say there were instances where the president would say, people are telling me this, or I've heard this, or I saw on television, you know, this this impropriety in Atlanta or Pennsylvania or something. And we, we were in a position to say, uh, our people have already looked at that, and we know that you're, you're getting bad information, that that's, that's not correct. It's, it's been uh, it demonstrated to be uh, incorrect, from our point of view, uh, and been debunked. A month and a half or so after the election day, and at that meeting, you know, various allegations of fraud were discussed, um, and you know, Eric and Pat didn't, you know, told the group, the president included, that you know none of those allegations had been substantiated to the point where they could be the basis for any litigation challenge to the election. President Trump's own vice president and his top advisors also knew that there wasn't evidence to support the claims that the president was making. Anyone else other than Mr. Meadows who asked you about the status outside of your legal group, you know, Mr. Morgan and, and the others you mentioned, anyone else who asked you the status of what you were finding in your assessment of it? Uh, yes, sir. Who's that? Peter Navarro. When did you talk to Mr. Navarro? Mm, Mid-November. Around the same time as uh, Mr. Meadows? Yes, sir. And tell me about that conversation. Um, I recall him asking me questions about Dominion and maybe some other categories of allegations of voter fraud. And I remember telling him that I didn't believe the Dominion allegations because I thought the hand recount in Georgia would, would resolve any issues with a technology problem and with Dominion or Dominion flipping votes. And I, I mentioned at that time that the CISA Chris Krebs had recently released a report saying that the election was secure. And I believe Mr. Navarro accused me of being an agent of the deep state working with Chris Krebs against the president. And I never took another phone call from Mr. Navarro. Anyone else besides Mr. Meadows, Mr. Navarro, Mr. Hertzman that you had discussions with uh, inquiring about what you were finding in your uh, review of the allegations that were pouring in. I believe I had about a 15 second conversation with the vice president about it as well. When was that? During one of the visits to the White House. I don't know which one. I think it was the first one in November. I was I had met him briefly at the campaign and he remembered me and saw me. And uh, he asked what I was doing on the campaign. And I told him that, you know, we were looking into some of the issues related to voter fraud. And he asked me, I don't remember his exact words, but he asked me if uh, we were finding anything. And I said that I didn't believe we were finding it, or I was not personally finding anything um, sufficient to alter the results of the election. And he, he thanked me. That was our interaction. At a later hearing, you'll hear live testimony from the former acting Deputy Attorney General of the Department of Justice, Rich Donahue. But now I'd like to play a portion of his testimony. I tried to, again, put this in perspective and to try to put it in very clear terms to the president. And I said something to the effect of, sir, we've done dozens of investigations, hundreds of interviews. The major allegations are not supported by the evidence developed. We've looked at Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada. We're doing our job. 
much of the info you're getting is false. And then I went into, for instance, this thing from Michigan, this report about 68% error rate. Reality is it was only 0.0063% error rate, less than one in 15,000. So the president accepted that. Um, he said, okay, fine, but what about the others? And again, this gets back to the point that there were so many of these allegations that when you gave him a very direct answer on one of them, he wouldn't fight us on it, but he would move to another allegation. So then I talked about a little bit about the Pennsylvania truck driver. This is another allegation that had come up. And uh, this claim was by a truck driver who believed, perhaps honestly, that he had transported an entire tra uh, tractor trailer truck full of ballots from New York to Pennsylvania. And this was again out there in the public and discussed. And I essentially said, look, we looked at that allegation. We looked at both ends, both the people who load the truck and the people who unload the truck. Um, and that, that allegation was not supported by the evidence. Uh, again, he said, okay. And then he said, no, I didn't mention that one. What about the others? And I said, okay, well, with regard to Georgia, we looked at the tape, we interviewed the witnesses. There is no suitcase. The president kept fixating on this suitcase that supposedly had fraudulent ballots and that the suitcase was rolled out from under the table. And I said, no, sir, there is no suitcase. You can watch that video over and over. There is no suitcase. There is a wheeled bin where they carry the ballots, and that's just how they move ballots around that facility. There's nothing suspicious about that at all. Um, I told them that there was no multiple scanning of the ballots. One, of the, one part of that allegation was that they were taking one ballot and scanning it through three or four or five times to rack up votes, presumably for Vice President Biden. I told them that the video did not support that. Um, then he went off on double voting at the top of the next page. He said, dead people are voting. Indians are getting paid to vote. He meant people on uh, Native American reservations. He said, there's lots of fraud going on here. I told him flat out that much of the information he's getting is false and or just not supported by the evidence. We look at the allegations, but they don't pan out. Mr. Barr and his advisors were not the only ones who determined that the president's allegations regarding Dominion voting machines were false. So, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record of this hearing reports issued by the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, otherwise known as CISA, that addressed and rejected the claims of manipulation of voting machines in the 2020 election. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also ask unanimous consent to include in the record a report prepared by the Michigan Senate Oversight Committee that disproved claims of election fraud in Michigan, as well as a statement by 59 of the country's leading election security scientists, noting the absence of any credible evidence that the 2020 election had been altered through technical compromise, and five other reports from organizations and individuals confirming there was no widespread fraud in the 2020 election or describing the spread of the former uh, president's lies. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Pursuant to the order of the committee for today, the chair declares the committee in recess for a period of approximately 10 minutes.